Hello, my name is David Malin, and I'm the instructor for Computer Science E1, Understanding Computers and the Internet at Harvard University's Extension School. You're watching one of our videos of the week. For more such videos or information about this course, visit us on the web at computerscience1.org. Enjoy the show. Hello, my name is Eugenia Kim. I am a teaching fellow for Computer Science E1. This is a video of the week. In this particular video of the week, we are going to have a special speaker, David Malin, talk about a program called Google Earth. Let's turn our attention now to, again, this topic of the Internet. And frankly, Google Earth is just too cool not to revisit in this class. So tonight will be entirely about Google Earth, if only because it's the coolest thing that I've wasted several hours on over the past couple of weeks. How many of you out of curiosity downloaded this program after last week? So a few of you know that, one, the software is entirely free, which means we have the luxury of being able to play with it with the expectation that Others in the class and beyond are certainly welcome to do the same. But with that said, we've got this spinning globe here. I thought I would take us right away, as we may have done last time, to 1 Oxford Street in Cambridge, Mass. 02138. Just a quick tutorial. At the top left of this program, if you've not used it before, is a little search box. You can type an address in there. Uh, Google is pretty good about knowing if you type Eiffel Tower, where in the world that is. So it's pretty good about guessing where certain popular locations are, but you can more precisely specify a US address, a foreign address for most countries, a latitude and longitude, and sort of other tricks as well. I'm going to go ahead and click Enter after typing that in. And if nothing else, to be honest, it's perhaps the fundamentally unnecessary, dare say gratuitous animations that make this program so cool. As we zoom in here to our location, 1 Oxford Street, of course, is where? Right here. So we have now a uh, bird's eye view from a, very, a bird that's currently flying at about 3,000 feet. You can see in the bottom right corner of the screen your altitude, at least in feet. You can change that to meters or kilometers if you prefer via one of the menu options. But notice, and it's a little hard to see if you don't know to look for it, certainly on our screen here, in the top right of the screen where my cursor is, there's a whole bunch of controls. One. There is a plus and minus in a vertical scroller. So if you simply click on that plus, as you might expect, things zoom in. If you instead click minus, you're going to zoom out. And then there's also a slider there where, with which you can sort of move it back and forth without just clicking. But it should be fairly intuitive if you click on the thing yourself. Meanwhile, you can certainly move horizontally and vertically and left to right and so forth to get a different vantage point, just like Google Maps. If you're familiar, you can click on the display and just drag it around, which is perhaps even more intuitive. And if you're really adventurous and zoom in, for instance, a little bit, and you kind of wonder what this building looks like from a different angle, you can use this slider up top to change your tilt. And you'll get a different perspective on the world. Notice, though, a curious thing happens the more and more we go down. It turns out the Earth is indeed flat. <laughs> Um, but this is obviously why, this, this result. Why are we seeing that? Right. So you don't have a satellite looking in your window. You have it looking on top of your house from up above. But there are certain parts of the world where you do have multiple angles or you have software. That the software is designed to sort of interpolate even better what the shapes of those mountains are or what the canyons are. And we'll go to one such place in just a moment. And this, meanwhile, I'm going to tilt us back up to a more reasonable level, then you have this big wheel, which by default points you north, but if you click on the big wheel and spin yourself around, you can sort of do a nice 180 spin in that way as well. Meanwhile, do take note, if you haven't seen it already, in the bottom left of your screen, you have a whole bunch of layers. This is a fun place to play around because it offers different features of this program. Um, notice that I have checked terrain. That's a good one to leave on because for those areas of the world where Google has sort of height information, it will show you more of a 3D perspective rather than an interpolated flat perspective. There's a whole bunch of other options here that you can play around with. If you want to find the nearest uh, pizza place in some areas, you can click on such things as dining or the nearest hotel, and it operates in that regard like Google Maps. But our purpose tonight is to sort of wow 
And so notice in the middle left of this screen, under the thing called places, that this is where you can store places you like. And essentially what problem set four asks you to do is to quote unquote place mark a number of specified locations. This is like bookmarking, but a physical location, and it's terribly simple. There's a little thumbtack here at the top of the program. You click that thumbtack, and notice you get one of these place marks in the middle of the screen. You can then click and drag it around. For instance, I'm putting it on top of Memorial Hall, which is just across the way outside this building. And then up here, you can type a name for it. So I could type Memorial Hall. It tells you already what the latitude and longitude is, if that's at all of interest. And then you can type a little description here, like where freshmen eat meals, for instance. The Annenberg Hall is inside of Memorial Hall. And then you click OK, and that's as though you've placed a bookmark of sorts into this actual world. Notice that this place mark ended up under this My Places section of the page. But it's only so much fun, if at all, listening to me talk. Why don't we take ourselves on a very brief tour, perhaps to one of these places where terrain is of interest. So notice that Google gives you by default this sightseeing folder. We created an empty folder a moment ago, but the program comes with a folder called sightseeing with a whole bunch of popular locations. And why don't we whisk ourselves over to the Grand Canyon. Suffice is just to double click on that thing. Notice we're heading out west in this country. We're about to zoom in, and the Grand Canyon is a wonderful example of if you have the terrain layer on, you'll actually get this 3D mapping. And then if you really want to have a sort of IMAX experience, you can use the keyboard to navigate these controls besides just using the top right, and you can sort of fly your way through the Grand Canyon and give yourself a little tour. It's really wild. And notice, by contrast, if I turn off terrain, <laughs> There you go, that's the Grand Canyon. So it does make a difference. Finally, let me offer you one other demo of my own design. Let's whisk ourselves away to Boston, Massachusetts. And again, little tricks like Boston, comma, MA. That's sufficient. Google's smart about figuring out what you mean. We're going to jump over here back to Massachusetts. It's going to zoom in. Here we have the main part of downtown. If I drag it over, you can see Boston Common there, the big green area in the middle. But let's focus in on the financial area or right downtown and click on one of these other layers, namely 3D buildings in just a moment. First, I'm going to zoom in, and you can see that these are pretty good photos of these buildings. But if you want to really get a 3D perspective, some cities have support for 3D buildings. People have built virtual models of these buildings such that now, if we dive into the middle of Boston, and sort of change our perspective, you can actually see what the city looks like from a 3D perspective. And you can do this for some of the major cities. New York is another one, and so forth. Now, here's where you get to partake. Before we go back to understanding the internet, let's use it for just one more minute or so. Where in the world would you like me to take you on this tour? London. So London, UK. Whisk ourselves away over the Atlantic. And in just a moment, we will find ourselves in central London. So there's the Thames, looking a little murky as always. And if we scroll ourselves here, it looks like this is the London Eye that it's taken us to, right there. So the big Ferris wheel of sorts in London. Oh, one other thing, especially for those of you who uh, use public transportation, let me take us back real quick to Boston, Mass. Show you one other layer that's kind of fun. I'm going to turn off 3D buildings by unchecking it. And then I'm going to turn on, under transportation, I'm going to turn on transit. And if you've ever wondered topologically what the MBTA system looks like, you can see it now with this nice overlay, not only for the, the subway, but also for the commuter rails if you zoom out. And the coolest thing, frankly, I never get tired of this, if you just hold on the keyboard and zoom out, I mean, it's like you're making your own movie, right? 2001 style. So, in any case, one more place. Where do you want me to take you? Big Ben National Park. Okay. Uh, sorry? What? Big Ben National Park. Big Ben National Park. Ben, ben, ben. Oh, Bend. Okay. Big Ben National Park. Let's see. Here we go. Good, another one where terrain is nicely depicted. Here too, I'll tilt this back on an axis. 
You can really see the 3D there. So it's pretty wild. This has been a video of the week. Thank you for watching.